everyone and welcome to our Linguistic Landscape Project. Our group members are Giselle Wilson, Himari Simans, Kumiko Ishizuka, Claire Vinehage, and myself, Isali Suarez. Linguistic Landscape provides a window into the social linguistic makeup of a certain geographical area. The area observed for our project was Miami's Little Havana, a neighborhood known for evoking a pre-Castro Cuban nostalgia witnessed in its colorful districts that are embedded with Hispanic culture and immigrant pride. Throughout our presentation, we will make note as to how the signage displayed represents the area. According to Google Maps, Little Havana is a neighborhood located in the United States, and more specifically, Miami, Florida. Its northeasternmost border follows along the Miami River, going as far north as Northwest 20th Street as far west as Northwest 37th Avenue, and as far south as Southwest 16th Street, and lastly, stretching as far to the east as I-95. Now for a brief history of the region. The neighborhoods of Little Havana were originally a lower middle class Jewish neighborhood in the 1930s, what is known today as Calle Ocho was nothing but a dirt road known as the Trail that was primarily used for the agricultural transport of citrus groves. The late 1950s sparked a sudden revolution in the Cuban regime, and many Cubans fled the country, heading towards South Florida in the early 1960s. Because of this, a vast influx of Cuban immigrants settled in the neighborhoods west of downtown Miami, and these neighborhoods became the epicenter of anti-revolution activities and Cuban exile. Cuban immigrants initially planned for a temporary stay in the area, in hopes of Castro's deposition. However, many permanently settled and by 1970, more than 85% of the residents were Cuban and had established family-owned businesses. Today, Little Havana has been deemed a national landmark in Miami, and remains the emotional center of South Florida's Latin community. Despite the area experiencing threats for redevelopment, the Historical Preservation Center has advocated for the area to receive the help it really needs. The master plan called Little Havana Me Importa was crafted to build small-scale infrastructure that would improve the livelihood of the residents and avoid endangering the area's cultural richness. This allows change without altering the old-school architecture of the neighborhood apartments and without much need for vertical urban expansion. This master plan would in fact conserve the cleanliness of the streets as opposed to other areas in Miami. Little Havana stands at a population of 82,614 residents. Of those residents, 49.7% are male and 50.3% are females. The age median of the region is 43 years old. As of now, about 42% of the residents in the area are not U.S. citizens. From the residents that are U.S. citizens, 25.7% were born in the United States whereas 32.3% were born outside the U.S. The ethnical makeup of the area is as follows. About 85% of residents are of Hispanic ethnicity. 3.79% of residents are African American. 10.14% are non-Hispanic whites. And 0.96% are all of other races and ethnicities. That being said, Little Havana continues to have a major Hispanic population. During this project, our research mainly focused on the southern area of Little Havana, located on A Street between Southwest 17th Avenue and Southwest 12th Avenue. Before conducting research, our group formulated a hypothesis. We concluded that all of the signage in the area, which includes temporary, official, and unofficial signage, is meant to attract tourists originally from foreign Hispanic cultures who wish to come and experience a sense of nostalgia.
We mainly conducted our linguistic landscape research virtually by using Google Map to see streets and inside of restaurants. We also looked at websites to find supporting information. Some of us drove there to take pictures, do interview, or seek temporary signs that we could not see online. Our research focused on and analyzed official signs, unofficial signs, street art, restaurant menus, and temporary signs. We worked both individually and as a group. Everyone was assigned a role on particular signage and art to establish hypotheses, observations, and analysis during meetings. As a group, we collected supporting information about Little Havana. During our research, we looked at many types of signage, like official signs, unofficial signs, temporary signs, street art, and restaurant menus. First, let's look at the observation and analysis of official signage. Observation of official signs show that all of the government-issued signs include English, Arabic numbers, and symbols, but most often do not include Spanish or any trace of Cuban culture. However, there were some exceptions. For instance, the official street sign for 8th Street included its other names, Cale Ocho and Celia Cruzway. Cale Ocho was the name given to 8th Street by the Cubans who fled Fidel Castro's Marxist dictatorship and immigrated to this neighborhood. By the late 1960s, many were referring to 8th Street as Cale Ocho in recognition of the vibrant Cuban refugee presence there. Celia Cruzway was the name that was added to 8th Street in honor of Celia Cruz, a female Cuban singer who was one of the most popular Latin artists of the 20th century. The street name Celia Cruzway was added in 1990. The history and culture behind these street names are of course a big part of the identity of Cuban immigrants and people of Cuban descent. However, the official signs do not give these street names a special status or display, and therefore do not go a step further to give the street names a cultural context. This can be said because the fonts and colors of the street names Cale Ocho and Celia Cruzway are the exact same as the street name 8th Street. In terms of the visual style of official signs, they are all written horizontal, which coincides with the mainstream writing system of writing horizontally in English, as opposed to writing vertically in Japan or other Asian countries. The colors used on official signs were mainly white, black, red, blue, and green. There was one exception of brown in the sign for a cultural statement. None of these colors were used aesthetically in ways that blurred the colors together or created a complicated design. No matter what color was used, the images they made up were very simple and did not convey any kind of aesthetic value. All signs were visible for anyone on the street. This makes sense because official signs are meant to signify information on public land, not in privately owned businesses. The official signs were all positioned on traffic lights, metal poles on the sidewalk, or on objects on the sidewalk. Signs themselves were made out of metal, with the words shaped or printed into the metal. This may be because the local government does not want their signs to be easily ruined by weather or external forces. 
The need to maintain these signs makes a lot of sense because the information on the official signs, like the speed limit signs or the one-way street signs, are crucial for keeping the public safe from traffic accidents. Also, the official signs, like street name signs, serve the important purpose of helping people navigate their way through the area. This observation, it can be said that official signs do not contribute to creating a nostalgic Cuban atmosphere. Official signs in Little Havana do not serve an aesthetic or cultural purpose for the most part, but there are a few exceptions. Instead, official signs serve the opposite purpose. Aesthetic and cultural signs are relatively open to interpretation. On the other hand, the official signs that have been observed cannot have different meanings for each person because their safety depends on it. Therefore, official signs cannot be thought of as a way which is used to create Cuban nostalgia. Unofficial signs are examples of signage displayed by the people for the people. Examples of unofficial signs are those displayed in both the exterior and interior of store shops and private businesses. When observing unofficial signs in Cala Ocho, we notice that the language displayed on unofficial signs accommodates a respective target audience. For instance, non-essential shops such as souvenir shops, cigar shops, and art music lounges who aim their services at tourists rather than locals displayed signs that were primarily in English. Because English is known to be the universal language, a generalization of tourism is inferred rather than tourism from a specific region that would entail the display of additional languages. Those signs are in English. The exterior and interior designs of these shops are purposed for offering tourists a little piece of Cuban heritage as the products or services sold there relate to Cuban culture. However, unofficial signage displayed on essential shops such as local supermarkets, tailor shops, and local family businesses that have been established in the area for more than a decade mostly displayed signs in Spanish only or incorporated both Spanish and English on their signs. The use of Spanish signs may be because these shops cater more towards the Hispanic residents of the area rather than to tourists. One of the most popular shops in the area, Los Pinarenos Fruteria, is a Cuban family-owned fresh fruit market that captures the reminiscence of Cuba's rustic street markets. The signs inside the store are displayed in Spanish to preserve the Cuban-inspired attributes the store offers to its customers. Based on our observation on unofficial signs, a second approach can be deduced as to why signs are displayed in both Spanish and English. Even though a higher Hispanic demographic lives in the area, second and third generation Hispanics may not always speak Spanish. Therefore, the use of bilingual signs may be there to facilitate any linguistic barriers the residents of the region may have. That being said, we concur that the linguistic landscape observed in unofficial signs is one that may contribute to our notion of the area's evocation of a pre-revolution Cuban nostalgia, but also one that acts as a dependent variable of establishment's purpose in the region. Now let's move on to the observation and analysis of temporary signs. These temporary signs in the Miami-Dade public bus system show people of many different cultural backgrounds frequent the area. Do use of the writing in three different languages in both the signs. When you get to the historic district of Cale Ocho, Spanish and English are the primary languages. As you can see here in this photo, the man is looking at the door of a supermarket 
with temporary signs written in both Spanish and English separately. Propaganda is written in Spanish and English. Notice a ZKEE -E sticker is found covering certain words which make a new phrase. While graffiti is another language, it seemingly has uniform characters. In this area, this shows how the underground world or taggers mark territory. Most of this is removed as the area between 12th and 17th is constantly repaired to allow tourists and natives feel pride for where they came from. Public outdoor locations are closed as it is seen to the left. Locals will not lose their spirit though. A sense of home comes from cigars as a private cigar shop adds new branding to its storefront, shown to the right. Some temporary signs on restaurants are both in English and Spanish. This shows the need for bilingual use in the area. The temporary sign at restaurant El Pub being fully in Spanish shows its local native clientele speak Spanish. It opened in 1963. It is one of the local businesses that bring nostalgia to the area as it preserved through time. As 25% of businesses stay open, temporary official signage like the electric one shown on the left are in bilingual use. Use of temporary canvas signs shown are also necessary for native people. Local business owners are hoping the COVID-19 disease will slow in spreading and be able to open up in full capacity soon. This was expressed by business owners by word of mouth and by the sign temporary and not able to withstand hurricane season, which is coming soon. Temporary signs advertising rooms to live in are in Spanish, and this appeals to the natives of Spanish-speaking communities. Observation and Analysis of Street Art By focusing on street art, we found what the street art is for. We noticed that the street art is not only on the street, but also inside some shops and on trash cans. In addition, there are many ornaments of hens. Here is a little bit of information that explains why the rooster is often sighted in Little Havana. Artist R.C. Armas said on July 20th, 2020, that the rooster is a sign of good luck in Havana. He is the co-founder of a shop on 8th Street who graduated college for art in Cuba and studied art in the US. He has a piece, Three Wise Roosters, each rooster highlights one of the three senses of either hearing, seeing, or speaking. Down Cale Ocho, there are roosters, including the live ones pictured. These roosters provide Cuban speech alive throughout the landscape of Cale Ocho. Their tie to good luck is needed right now with many people losing liquidity of tourism dollars. In some street art, there are written words. The words are mostly in Spanish, but some are in English. There is also a painting that uses Spanish and English words side by side. The words are handwritten and in horizontal order. colors, we can notice that most of the art is painted in vivid colors which are used in Cuban paintings. Blue, red, and white are frequently used and are the colors of the Cuban flag and also the American flag.
When we look at this art closely, a phrase, Viva Nuestra Raza, is written. The phrase has a literal meaning of long live race. However, it is a phrase that is used by Hispanic people to show their Hispanic American pride. Additionally, there are flags of Hispanic countries such as Cuba, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Panama, and Honduras. Since then, we found that the pride is shown not only by Cubans, but also by immigrants from other countries in the Central America and the Caribbean islands. As you can see in this picture and this painting, two people are mentioned, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. George Washington is mentioned here as Padre de la Independencia Norteamericana, which means the father of American independence. For Abraham Lincoln, it is written that he is libertador de la esclavitud, which means the liberator of slavery. From this, we can see that these immigrants are proud of their history and showing their pride for their history by street art. After speaking with and viewing the work of artist Rafael C. Armas, it is clear that murals like these are here to make Latin natives feel a sense of nostalgia. Mr. Armas studied art in Cuba and the U.S. He is Cuban, born, and lived here all five years of his life during which he moved to the Little Havana, opened and co-owns an art gallery on 8th Street and 12th Avenue. His vibrant colors are the same as used in his mural they represented the modern Cuban style. Though some of his work he considered realistic and others abstract, they are used seeing the same intensity of color which this mural does. Also, the beachy subject matter reminds tropical climate-born natives of home. Caribbean areas, for instance, Cuba and the Dominican Republic have this landscape and therefore will be more attracted to live in or vacation near Cale Ocho to the modern artist take of their homeland. Our hypothesis that street art is for creating the atmosphere to make the immigrants feel at home was right, but there are more meanings to the street art in 8th Street. The street art is mostly drawn in Cuban style with vivid colors to create a Cuban atmosphere. However, we also found that the street art is a way for Hispanic immigrants to show their pride of being who they are in their history so that they can honor their ancestors. And by the word Hispanic, we mean not only Cuban, but also other countries in Central America and the Caribbean islands. Next, we'll take a look at the design and menus of the restaurants in the area. Inside the restaurants along 8th Street, we can see that certain interior design elements are influenced by Hispanic cultures and are there to fully immerse you in the restaurant's concept. As an example, we can take a look at the interior of El Santo Taqueria. Mexican-themed flyers with Spanish-influenced lettering and art line the walls of this Mexican restaurant which specializes in tacos and burritos. Furthermore, we discovered that all of the restaurant names on A Street mean something or translate to something whether they are in English or in a foreign language. In this case, La Esquina de la Fama, as pictured above, is in Spanish and it translates directly to the Corner of Fame. The outside of the restaurant has both Spanish and English and as you can see, they advertise the most important aspects like most famous mijito and the best Cuban sandwich in English. Therefore, we can assume that they are trying to attract the widest customer pool possible by appealing to both local residents and tourists. Now let's move on to the observation and analysis of restaurant menus. First, we have Mongofos Restaurant. The menu on the right is written in Spanish 
and the one on the left is written in English. Both are written horizontally. The two languages, Spanish and English, are both given separate menus instead of having both languages written on the same menu. This tells us that there are customers who are fluent in Spanish and prefer to order their menus from the Spanish menu. On the other hand, the full English menu can be thought of as the restaurant status as a place where tourists come. Let's look at El Santo Taqueria. The paper menu on the left is written in English and Spanish. The menu on the right that has been spray painted onto the restaurant's wall, which in a way resembles street art, and is written mostly in Spanish. This restaurant creates a strong feel of Cuban culture, especially because the Spanish language on both kinds of menus is given more detail and noticeable features. Now let's look at El Cristo restaurant. The menu uses both Spanish and English. Spanish is written in green and capital letters. In contrast, the English is written plainly in black and in normal font. This may suggest that the Spanish signage is being emphasized more than the English. However, most of the categories that are written in blue letters are in English. It is hard to say which language is given a higher status here, but it can be said with certainty that this restaurant is a place for both customers who are fluent in Spanish and other customers such as tourists who need English instruction. Observation of restaurants show that the design and cuisine of restaurants on Southwest A Street between Southwest 17th Avenue and Southwest 12th Avenue tend to be influenced by foreign cultures. Most of the restaurant menus had the names of the dishes in a foreign language with the description of the dish in English below it. Therefore, the linguistic landscape that can be observed in restaurants is not exclusive to Spanish and Cuban culture, but to non-Spanish languages as well. This suggests that the use of both Spanish and non-Spanish languages are essential to keeping the restaurant businesses going and therefore keep the Cuban culinary culture alive in the area. So in this case, the blend of multiple languages in the linguistic landscape helps preserve the Cuban nostalgia that is felt in Little Havana. Before observing and analyzing Little Havana, we reached a hypothesis that said all of the signage in the area, which includes temporary, official, and unofficial signage, is meant to attract tourists originally from foreign Hispanic cultures who wish to come and experience a sense of nostalgia. However, after our observation and analysis, we can now argue that official signage is used as a means for keeping the public safe rather than as a way to create nostalgia for immigrants. Furthermore, unofficial signage like business signs, restaurant menus, and street art is used as a way for immigrants to proudly show where they came from as well as their history and culture. In conclusion, our hypothesis was not completely correct because we determined that official and unofficial signage do not equally contribute to creating a sense of nostalgia. Instead, we found that unofficial signage contributes more than official signage because official signage is more focused on helping residents and tourists safely navigate the area. Since the unofficial signage is more focused on creating a sense of nostalgia and showing the residents' cultural background, tourists may be misled to believe that the area is trying to embody Havana, Cuba, rather than blend together the residents' love for America and their homeland. Nonetheless, Little Havana will always be the historic destination that offers Latin immigrants a place close to home for many generations to come.